marhaban wa ahlan bakum fi baranamij dakhil Washington. Ma'akum mudifakum, Robert Satloff. Yukal ana diplomasi en najikh rajil sharif yufad il al kharij le yakdub le maslahat baladihi. Wa William Burns yan tabik alayhi dun shak an nusul awal min al mu'iyar fa huwa bil ta'akid rajil sharif. Sayata ayyin alayna anus alihi in can alamar thalatha wa thalatheen aman min amalihi bisilk diplomasi haythu tatadaraja fi el munasib illa an wasala ila mansib naib wazir al kharajia kad an tabik alayhi an nusathani min al mu'iyar aida. Aba ab tariq al ameriki kila rau hadhal kidr min al tariq. Wa shakalu el tarikh kedelek, methal al deleka deifana el mutamayiz. Fahua kabir fi kul min al Arabia wal Rusia. Yachtal makkadan fi al sufuf el amamia le yashad el lahavat el adima fi zamanana. Man nahia el harb el barida, illa masirat el harb el salam fi shark al ausat. You said ruusa kele el hisbain. Mundu thalatha ukud, wal shayb aladhi ya'alu ra'asihi khair dalil ala dalek. Le munakasha ad-durus al-mustafada min masiratihi al-makhniya al-mudhisha. Ya surni anu rahib be Bill Burns, ra'is Merikaz Carnegie, wa naib wazir al-kharajia al-asba. Welcome back to Dachau, Washington. We're sitting here in a conference room in the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, interviewing the President, former Deputy Secretary of State, Bill Burns. Bill, thank you so much for joining us today. Rob, it's a pleasure, and congratulations on the anniversary. Oh, thank you. Um, so, Bill, we, we have an opportunity to talk about your extraordinary 33-year career in American diplomacy and some of the lessons you took away from that experience that you imparted to uh, some of your younger colleagues. Um, uh, let me just start with, after 33 years, when you look back, what did you learn in 1982, 1983, when you first started, that stayed with you all throughout your career? Mm, that's a really good question, and somehow the U.S. government survived my 33 years as a diplomat, but I was very fortunate during that period. I mean, there's certainly a lot of things have changed in diplomacy and the international landscape over those more than 33 years now. I think the one thing that didn't change and the kind of lesson that I learned at the outset and took away um, through all those years is the importance of human interactions. I mean, in the end, diplomacy is about um, developing an understanding of another society, whether it's in the Middle East or in other parts of the world, in developing an ability to put yourself in the other person's shoes, uh, to do something that sometimes is a little bit of an unnatural act for Americans to listen, but also to have a very clear sense of what animates you as an American diplomat, American interests, uh, the values that we think are universal. And so I think from early on, from my first posting in Jordan in 1982, I think I took away a very strong appreciation for the importance of those human interactions and everything that comes with that, understanding other foreign languages, wherever you're serving in the world, having a feel for another society, because that's really, I think, how you add value as a diplomat, as you're trying to help policymakers in Washington understand how best to navigate a complicated landscape and how you're helping people in whatever country in which you're working understand Washington, which is oftentimes not an easy thing to do either. Now you picked uh, uh, two of the tougher societies and languages to penetrate in your career, Arabic on one hand and Russian on the other. Why? I wish I could say it was part of some, you know, sort of careful plan. Um, I had studied Arabic when I was in graduate school. Um, and so I had a little bit of experience of the Middle East. My first posting was in Jordan. Um, I, I really enjoyed the experience, not just the politics, but the culture and the society. And so that kind of led me into spending a good bit of my career on Middle East issues. But I had also been interested in Russia. And so 10 years into my foreign service career, I took a year and a half to study Russian intensively and then went to our embassy in Moscow in the mid-1990s 
just after the end of the Cold War on my first posting and later returned there as ambassador towards the end, at least, of the overseas part of my career. Um, now, there are some uh, remarkable technological changes that have occurred, uh, and I want to ask you how this has affected diplomacy. I mean, do, do diplomats still do something antiquated called cables? They, yeah, they still do. I mean, the, one of the biggest changes over those more than three decades is the sheer volume of information that moves in the world and the pace with which it moves. And so for diplomats to add value, um, it's partly trying to keep up with that rapid flow of information, but it's also trying to provide a perspective, trying to answer the so what question for policy making policymakers in Washington. So what does this development mean? The ability to digest all that information, which is comes at you kind of in huge tidal waves in this age of information technology, and provide a sense of perspective and be able to look, in an ideal world at least, two or three steps down the road, um, which is a really difficult task in policymaking sometimes, to be able to anticipate second and third order consequences of particular actions that the U.S. government might take or inaction, which sometimes is just as complicated to understand as, as the consequences of action. Um, but these days there are so many other inputs into right. how your leaders back home will consider a, uh, a problem. How does an ambassador break through that, the noise and make sure that his voice gets heard? Well, part of it is timing. It's, it's understanding a moment in which you can get an audience in Washington for a particular question or a concern that you want to emphasize. Part of it, obviously, is the, the quality of your analysis and hopefully your recommendations, because I've always been a big believer that ambassadors overseas are not just uh, postal service workers. They're not just there to deliver messages from one government to another, they're there to help shape the way in which policies uh, evolve in Washington as well. And so being able to pick your spots and have a good sense of timing is, is really important for good ambassadors overseas. So I want to ask you about some of the specific lessons. You wrote a fascinating uh, parting essay um, uh, in which you gave uh, current diplomats or younger diplomats 10 observations, lessons from your experience. Um, uh, a couple of the early ones seem to go together. Um, you opened by suggesting, uh, remember where you're from, right. and then you said, and also remember that it's not always about us. Right. What do you mean? Well, remembering where you're from is pretty straightforward, and that is that, you know, if you're an American diplomat serving overseas, what you're about is promoting the interests and, and hopefully the values that matter most to the United States. Um, and it's, it's surprising sometimes to, to the extent to which ambassadors, even very, uh, even very experienced ones, can lose sight of that reality. But it's also equally important, in my view, to remember that it isn't all about us. And Americans tend to have this view of the world that everything revolves around us sometimes. But oftentimes, it's particularly true, I think, in the Arab world, but it's certainly true in other parts of the world that, that you know, I've lived in or served over the years, that other people and other societies are always going to be animated by their own realities and their own perspectives. They're not always going to be uh, hospitable to American interests. And so you, you have to understand the perspectives that people, not just leaders, but people in other societies are going to employ as well. What motivates them? What are their priorities if you want to be able to navigate American policy successfully? And have you, uh, have you seen uh, examples of either of these, both of these, in the field where diplomats either forgot it's about us or um, sure. Uh, uh, or forget it's about them sometimes. Sure. I mean, in the first instance, there's there's something called clientitis um, in, you know, American diplomacy, which is the, you know, it's the illness that befalls ambassadors or diplomats sometimes over and overseas when they forget what they're about and you know whose interests they're supposed to be promoting, um, and begin to lose sight of that sort of core priority. I think in the not all about us category, I think I even as you look back at the Arab Spring and the revolutions which have transformed so much of the Arab world over the course of the last five years or so, there was also a tendency early on for American policymakers to see some of those changes as in some way 
about the United States. And my impression, I mean, people in the region know this far better than I ever will, but my impression always was that what animated people, whether it was in Tunisia or in Tahrir Square in Cairo a few months later, was as much a sense of indignity as anything else, a sense that they weren't getting the political voice or the economic opportunities um, that they thought as citizens in those countries they deserved. And that really didn't have as much to do directly with American policy. That's not to say that there weren't a lot of resentments and frustrations about different aspects of American policy, but that wasn't at the core, I don't believe at least, of what was happening and what continues to happen this day. Now, one of your other suggestions is uh, um, to remember the fundamentals of diplomacy, uh -huh. and this goes back to your earlier comment about ultimately it's a people-to-people -people business. But today, leaders can pick up the phone and talk to each other. Uh, uh, how difficult is it, or more difficult is it today, to be as relevant as an ambassador if you know this king or this president can call up the White House? It's it's, you know, it's, it's more complicated and sometimes more of a challenge, but good ambassadors, I think, realize that they have a perspective to offer and an ability to shape things on the ground through face-to-face -face conversations uh, and their own efforts and the efforts of their embassies that the telephone call isn't going to be a good substitute for. So, I mean, good ambassadors understand that you want to take advantage of the information technology revolution, the ability of senior leaders to talk directly to one another, but understand also that that's not sufficient, that there's a role for ambassadors to play on the ground that are extremely important. And wh what's the magic sauce in building a relationship with a king or a president when you're in a foreign capital? You've had to yeah. build relationships with some interesting people. How yeah. do you do it? Well, it's, I mean, it's, it's like human relationships in general. I think what you have to try to build is a relationship of trust. So that, in other words, what you say um, you can deliver on, uh, commitments that you make you can follow through on, um, that you're willing uh, sometimes to say things that aren't going to be convenient. You're willing to offer criticism sometimes, even you know, hopefully constructive criticism, but you're willing to take issue. Um, and that's, that's important as well. The way in which you do that is important, it seems to me. I've yet to meet the foreign, foreign audience, whether it's in the Middle East or any place else, that likes being preached to or lectured by Americans. But that's not to say that we shouldn't um, be quite direct sometimes when we have concerns. Uh, even realizing that those concerns aren't going to be appreciated. Um, but that's it, the key to that, I think, is building a relationship of trust over time. Okay, very good. When we are back with Bill Burns, we'll continue our discussion about lessons from his more than 30 years as a senior American diplomat in just a moment. <laughs> Our guest today is Bill Burns. Bill retired in 2014 as Deputy Secretary of State, only the second career diplomat in American history to serve in that high position. He is currently the president of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, the oldest international affairs think tank in the United States. With his retirement, Bill concluded a remarkable 33-year career in American diplomacy. This career included service as ambassador to Russia and to Jordan, under secretary of state for political affairs, assistant secretary of state for Near Eastern affairs, and senior director on the National Security Council for Near East and South Asia affairs. In fact, there was hardly a major issue of strategic significance in Europe or the Middle East over the last 30 years in which Bill has not played a central role, often as a key policymaker or major problem solver. On top of that, Bill, who I have known from my earliest days in Washington, is universally praised as being that rarest of Washingtonians, a kind, fair, generous, nice guy. Bill received his undergraduate degree from LaSalle University and his master's and doctorate degrees from Oxford University. He and his wife have two daughters. So, Bill, one of your um, uh, lessons has to do with the importance of economics. Mm -hmm. um, this wasn't always a, a key issue on the topic of American diplomats. Uh, is it more so today? 
It is. I mean, in the sense that the U.S. economy, like the economies of so many other countries around the world, is more and more connected to the global economic market. More and more American jobs depend on increasing U.S. exports overseas, and so that puts a premium uh, for U.S. embassy overseas on being supportive of American businesses as they try to Im expand exports and trade and investment understanding local economic landscape so you can be helpful to American businesses, um, and at the same time trying to encourage two-way trade back and forth between the country you know, where you're representing the United States and the United States as well. So it's, it's increased uh, quite significantly you know, over the course of my career in the Foreign Service. And uh, how much in your, in your job do, do American corporations like to think that uh, American ambassadors and American diplomats work for them? Uh, to, oh. to, to advance their interests abroad. Well, okay, I mean, there's some truth to the fact that we do work for American, not for specific corporations, but for American business in general. And I think good ambassadors and their staffs demonstrate that they can add value to the efforts that even the biggest American companies make overseas. But I think it's important also, as I mentioned, to look at the ways in which the United States can work with partners overseas at critical moments. For example, when I was ambassador to Jordan, shortly after King Hussein died, the transition to King Abdullah had occurred, we began negotiation of a bilateral free trade agreement. At that time, it was the f only the fourth bilateral free trade agreement the United States had done any place in the world, first in the Arab world. Um, at 1998, when I became ambassador, I remember the total Jordanian exports to the United States were about $9 million a year. Um, after the free trade agreement was concluded, within the next four or five years, Jordanian exports to the United States totaled more than a billion dollars. That created a lot of good jobs in Jordan at the time. It was a boost to the Jordanian economy. It was useful to the United States, not just in economic terms, but also given the, you know, the significance of our relationship with Jordan at that critical moment. So that's the kind of place where an ambassador and, and her or his staff can play a very important role. Uh, you had another couple of recommendations that also seem paired. One of them is uh, when trying to address issues, build leverage first. Uh -huh. And then secondly, you suggested uh, don't just identify problems, come up with solutions. And the connection between leverage and solutions, right. I think, is pretty organic. What did you have in mind here? Well, one of the common criticisms of the State Department sometimes in Washington is that people are too passive. In other words, that, you know, um, whether it's ambassadors overseas or people in the State Department here um, are not as committed to as much to problem solving as they should be. And I think it's crucial, as I said before, for ambassadors to see their role since they're the president's senior representative on the ground at not just admiring problems or identifying them, but actually offering practical solutions. Now, their solutions may not always be the one, you know, Washington policymakers decide upon, but that's uh, the role of, I think, any effective ambassador. So I think, you know, being activist in that sense is extremely important. That leads me to the speak truth to power uh -huh. uh, recommendation. Uh, you said that uh, um, you had a high regard for those diplomats over the years um, who resigned in protest. Mm -hmm. Did you ever consider resigning in protest over a, uh, a I, policy you disagreed with? You know, I think the truth is that any American diplomat who's worked on Middle East issues off and on over a number of decades has had moments when they wondered um, about whether or not they could honestly and faithfully and energetically carry out policies that they had real concerns about. Um, so as I said, I've had respect for oh, roughly two dozen of my colleagues who over differences over policy in the Balkans in the early 1990s resigned. It's not an easy thing in human terms for a lot of those officers. I mean, they'd invested 20 years in some cases in the diplomatic service. They had built their professional lives around that. They had kids getting ready to go to college. They're not easy choices to make. And a lot of respect for their willingness to make that choice. There were a smaller number, three or four, I think, over the Iraq War in 2003, who made a similar kind of choice. So, as I said, I have great respect for that, but I also think that there's a very important role to be played from within a system to be honest about your concerns about a policy, even when it's inconvenient to policymakers, because that's what you owe um, as a diplomatic professional. 
you also owe discipline as well. In other words, you're, you're obliged to offer honest policy analysis and recommendations to your superiors and to political decision makers, but you're also not supposed to go tell that to the New York Times. I mean, there's a discipline, or to any other media outlet, um, there's a discipline um, that, you know, that comes with that professional responsibility as well. And it's hard sometimes to balance those things. Bill, thank you very much for joining us for this discussion here on Death in Washington. My pleasure. Hava Nasilu Ilanehayat Hava Hilhalka Min Baranamaj Dakil Washington. I the Kenant Ladekum Eya is Taf Sarat or Ta'ali Kat Hawal Hava Hilhalka. Wa Khasatan Hawal Sana El Sias El Kharajia El Amerikia. Arjuan to Rasuluni Muba Sharatan. Allah Anwan El Barid Electroni Eteli Inside Washington at El Hura dot com. Ma Kum Robert Satloff Shukran Lekum Wa Ila Lekah.